Let's start with the uh, the Gold Gloves, where the Cardinals become the first team in the history of baseball to have five Gold Glove winners in a single season. You got Nolan Arenado at third base, his ninth consecutive in just nine seasons in the big leagues. Tyler O'Neill, a repeat winner in left field. Paul Goldschmidt selected for the fourth time. And then you have a couple of first-timers in Tommy Edmond at second base and Harrison Bader in center field. I think Harrison Bader is going to win a lot of these gold gloves. Tommy Edmond has the chance as well, and the fact that he usurps the former Cardinal, Colton Wong, at the second base position. Colton Wong was injured a lot this year as well. So, Jim, we knew, and and also the fact, I haven't checked Instagram. I don't know if there's a text or a, uh, a message from Yachty out there, but it's kind of <laughs> oh, no. funny that of all the people nominated, the one guy that doesn't win this year is Yachty, who is generationally the best defensive catcher at his position for the last 20 years or so and has nine gold gloves, and he's the guy that, that didn't win. So you're looking at, you're looking at one of the best defenses of all time, honestly, when this has never happened before. And then look at the guys who didn't win. Yachty, who has nine gold gloves. Remember, Adam Wainwright has two gold gloves. And he was your pitcher that logged the most innings. Okay, Dylan Carlson didn't win in right field. Mm -hmm. Also played a lot of center. That man had eight outfield assists. And oh, by the way, the platoon of Paul DeYoung, Edmundo Sosa, we're both very solid defensively, and actually, if you would have taken Edmundo Sosa's numbers over the course of a full season, he would have been knocking on the door in terms of numbers like defensive runs saved. This was a historically amazing defense. Uh, yeah, it definitely was. Look, they were, uh, I watched some pretty good ones in the mid-80s, really good defenses. In fact, that one infield that the Cardinals had with Hernandez, Her, Ozzy, and Oberkfell, you know, some people will argue that's one of the better ones we've ever seen. This is pretty good, the the one we have this year. Um, there's no doubt that they were the class of the National League and pretty much baseball throughout the year. Those gold gloves prove it. Um, I, as far as the Yachty thing, real quick, I, I didn't have a problem with him not winning one. Look, he is Me either. the generational catcher, yes, but he this was not Yachty's best year behind the plate. Stolen base, you know, uh, percentage was good. But, look, we all watched him. Let's be honest. This was not one of his better years behind the plate. And it was because the man's 38 years old and he's beat He's beat up. But it's not to diminish what he means to the baseball team. Uh, Arenado, yeah, okay. I, he had a really good – he had a good year. By his standards, he will tell you it's not his best year. But sometimes when you're that far above everybody else, you – Sometimes get that by merit, and I think that's part of it. Tyler O'Neill was easily the best left fielder in the game. Mm -hmm. I can't argue with that. Harrison Bader, 100%. If he would have been healthy, he would have blew all metrics away of anybody. A defensive run saved, all that stuff. Even though he was hurt, he deserves to win the, uh, the, the spot. First base, don't have a problem with Goldsmith at all. He was head and shoulders above everybody. The one where, I'm not saying I disagree with it, but Edmund is an interesting one just because he played a lot of left field for the Cardinals. Um, eventually, once everyone became healthy, he uh, settled in at second. I just, the guy he beat out, I, even though he was hurt, I have trouble going against Colton Wong, but good for him. Congratulations, he wins the thing. And I know you and Bernie have talked about this before, and he's big on the uh, the Fielding Bible Awards, which I think is interesting because, you know, Fielding Bible, they give out one award for each position. Mm -hmm. And so if you go to the 2021 winners, so it doesn't split it up, obviously, between American League and National League, but Paul Goldschmidt was the Fielding Bible Award winner at first base. Okay, so all of the big leagues. And then you have Whit Merrifield at second, which I have no argument against. Yep. Now here, third base, Key Brian Hayes, who if, if you watch Key Brian Hayes play, He's amazing He's defensively. Really Did not play a ton of innings this year. Right. He was injured early. Right. But still, his defensive runs saved numbers were so good that he won despite playing, I think, a little, and, and I'll, I'll get the exact number in a second, but a little more than half of the amount of innings of Nolan Arenado, where I don't think this was Nolan Arenado's best season defensively, but he's such a, a known name. He's such a good offensive player. 
He had eight straight, now nine straight. And look, if you have human beings that are making these votes, yeah, they remember things. And one thing that Nolan Arenado does is he makes the unbelievable highlight reel plays. I mean, how many come to mind immediately? The one on the tarp? There was there was one where he just freaking ran back like what a hundred a hundred feet and yep. caught a, a pop up. I mean, all the amazing diving plays, whether he's diving left or or right, throwing from his knees. When you say Nolan Arenado, three, four, five ridiculous web gem plays come to mind, and and those are plays that really stick in your mind. Like Key Brian Hayes, he's also playing in Pittsburgh. That's part of it. Yeah, you know, let's, I mean, let's face it. Yeah, we we see him up close, and when we do. When you're watching a Cardinals Pirates series, first of all, you're not really excited about that series at all. But <laughs> when you watch him play the Pirates, what, 19 times or so, for the games Key Brian Hayes was in there, you saw some amazing plays. He is really, really good. He is going to be an outstanding player. He'll get moved in about three more years once his value <laughs> goes up. But, yeah, and there will be a lot of teams that will be uh, happy to try and get him out of Pittsburgh. He's going to be a star uh, in this league, there's no doubt. But, uh, I, again, as you point out, once so you have – uh, the element of the human vote factor into this, you know, that a lot of times, and it's been the, the history of the award. Sometimes, like, oh yeah, you just he's the best there is. I'm going to give it to him, without really getting into too many numbers about. But maybe he wasn't his best year, but you know what? He's still the best guy out there. He he wins the award. So sticking with fielding Bible here, mm-hmm. this is the best player at just each position, regardless of league. So shortstop Carlos Correa. Fielding Bible did give left field to Tyler O'Neill. So not just nationally. Yeah, that Tyler O'Neill is the best yep. defensive left fielder in all of baseball. Center field, Michael A. Taylor, who's really good for the Kansas City Royals. Um, but but again, Harrison Bader, he deserved to win in the National League despite the fact that he was hurt. And, and yeah. if Harrison Bader plays 150 games, he probably wins the Fielding Bible Award for all of baseball because he was that good. And it wasn't like he missed a ridiculous amount of time, but he was injured early in the season. There. It affected the amount of innings he yes. played in center. And, you know, he had his numbers, defensive run save, were not that far off of Micah Taylor's, who played, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but a, a significant amount of more innings than Bader did. And if he would have played and been healthy, Bader would have had more. It so was, That's how good he was. I just, uh, I just rolled him up here from... FieldingBible.com. Mm-hmm. So Michael A. Taylor played 1,186 innings. Yep. And he had 19 total runs saved. Harrison Bader played 886 and two-thirds innings. So basically, exactly 300 fewer innings. So if you do the math on that, that's what, about 35 games-ish? Yeah. Ish? I mean, that's that's a significant it's portion. Don't month, get me wrong. It's a month of baseball. Right. But Harrison Bader had 15 Defensive run saved versus 19 for Michael A. Taylor, and that's playing 300 fewer innings. So if he plays the same amount of innings as Michael A. Taylor, he blows him out of the water. Yeah, absolutely. That's why he was the best center fielder in the National League. I didn't have a problem with that. So right field, in terms of fielding Bible awards, Aaron Judge. Catcher, Jacob Stallings won for all of baseball for the Pittsburgh Pirates. So it wasn't just the National League. I understand you do want Yachty to get to 10, especially. I think Yachty's going to make the Hall of Fame, but 10 gold gloves, even though it's one more. 10, when you get to that double digits, just looks so much better than nine. And I do think when you look at the numbers, and we read these off earlier, but Yachty is still fantastic at not only just throwing runners out, but also limiting the run game, whereas folks don't run on him. Right? There's an advantage yeah. there, too. They're not trying to take the extra base, but... Not just from the numbers, which we can talk about, which is pass balls, but also wild pitches. A great catcher can save wild pitches for you. This was not Yadier Molina's best receiving blocking year. It just wasn't. No, absolutely. He'd tell you that. Yeah. I mean, we how many times have we sit here during the summer on the radio station here and go, yeah, the one that got by him last night, he you could just tell his knees wouldn't allow him to move. That's a ball that you know, almost every catcher would get. And Look, respectfully, Jacob Stallings had an unbelievable defensive year Mm -hmm. where he set a record. I believe the record is, I don't know what the number is, but the record was uh, most games to start a season without an error by a catcher in the history of the game. I think that's warranted a a gold glove for sure. 
And so pitcher Dallas Keuchel wins the uh, Fielding Bible Award. And I also like the fact that Fielding Bible does the kind of the multi-position award. And, and that would factor into somebody like Tommy Edmond as well, because there are a lot of guys who play multiple positions. Go back to Ben Zobris, but look, that's where McMahon from the Rockies kind of gets uh, gets the short end of the stick. He was really good. Here's the guy that has to replace Nolan Arenado. You can make the case he was actually better at third base defensively, but also he was really good at second base. That was his thing. You you go, wow, he was that close to being as good as Arenado at third, but then you yeah, but he played a whole bunch at second too. I mean, in theory, if he would have played either possession or position the entire season, he could have won a gold glove at either one of those positions. That's how good he was. And that's where, so Ryan McMahon, Rockies, he has 13 defensive runs saved at third base. So he was second. And he's behind Key Brian Hayes. And both these guys played way fewer innings than Nolan Arenado. Mm-hmm. So Key Brian Hayes played 766 in the third innings, 16 defensive runs saved. Ryan McMahon plays 848 and in two-thirds innings, 13 defensive runs saved. Nolan Arenado is, is very far down. When I say that, I mean, he's top 10, but I'm talking about the guys across baseball. He had 1,312 innings. That's a ton. He was out there playing every day. You got to give him credit for that. But he had six defensive runs saved. There's another guy in the National League that actually played more, Austin Riley, who's known more as an offensive player. But Austin Riley was third for third baseman with 1,326 innings. And when I say third, I mean defensive runs saved. He's, he's tied for second with Ryan McMahon. So Austin Riley actually played more innings than Nolan Arenado, and he had seven more defensive runs saved. So he has he has a case as well. He does have a case. That's why I wasn't being disrespectful of Nolan, but there was a lot of guys that had almost as good, if not better, years than Nolan did this year. I mean, it. You know, I watched Riley in the playoffs and went, "Wow, uh, I need to pay attention a little bit more to this guy." I knew he was good, but I didn't realize how good he was until you see a guy on a pretty consistent basis. He's he's dynamite. Don't you also think that? Look, we knew the Cardinals were really good defensively. But when they start then to just rack up these offseason awards, I mean, you realize we're talking about a historically great defense, just in the fact that they were the first team ever to win five Gold Glove Awards in a single year. And we know this team, they, they wanted to be better than what they were. They won 90 games. They got to the wild card game. But I do think if you're a Cardinals fan, when you see that, And all those names I mentioned, they're all coming back. And I do think that defense, it's like, it's like the same in football. You always say defense travels. You say run game travels, right? That's something you can count on. Defense, for the most part, it's not as streaky as, as offense. You can have guys, their offense comes and goes and lefties versus righties and home and away. Defense, for the most part, you got to think it's going to be there for the Cardinals again in 2022. It really has been the last several years where, you got to give Mike Schilt credit. That That's something he did clean up. Now, I'll also give a lot of credit to the players, but if you're Mike Schilt, you're probably looking at these Gold Glove Awards saying, you know what, you basically hired me to clean up what you thought was a, you know, not the cardinal way defensively, base running, when Mike Matheny yep. basically got fired. Look look what we did. Look what we did the last three, three and a half years. We left... We left you with the defense, and, and it's it's organizationally. It's how you draft. It's how you develop. And, look, you, you traded for Paul Goldschmidt. You traded for Nolan Arenado. You traded for Tyler O'Neill. But also, Mike Schultz saying, man, I'm leaving Ali Marmol with a really nice, uh, really nice, uh, you know, kind of canvas to move forward. And, and also the fact that if the Cardinals can have any better luck pitching-wise, you're going to have – Healthy pitchers, it's got to be better than 2021. Pitching pitching with the best defense in baseball behind them. I mean, we already knew the Cardinals were going to be good next year, mm-hmm. but with, with any improved health and a couple additions on the pitching side, with this defense, you're going to win a lot of games strictly based on that, just run prevention. Uh, absolutely will. Uh, well, there was a couple of times, th- those crazy double plays we saw during the streak, part of that has to get credit to quality grade A defenders making plays. I mean, we even had the one where it was, well, you went from Goldschmidt to Molina to Arenado on that double play. I don't remember which, if that was the Cubs series or whatever, but you're like, 
Oh, he had three gold glovers touch the ball on that play. No wonder they <laughs> executed properly, right? Um, they are that good defensively. I remember having a conversation right before spring training. I think it was Bernie and I. We were just throwing some things around. And I made mention, and I said, you know, this could rival the best defensive team we've seen by the Cardinals ever. And that goes back to that team I told you about with the 80s with the Hernandez infield. I said, but time will tell if these guys get all their at-bats. Will O'Neill be there all year? Will Bader, you know, get enough at-bats? Well, they did, and they proved it. And back to your point about Schilt, he's got to get a lot of credit for that. I mean, he instilled whatever it is he instilled because it, it changed dramatically. Base running and defense became a, a another staple of the Cardinals, which Cardinal fans have come to appreciate over the years. It did disappeared under... Mike Matheny was like, gee whiz, we don't run the bases. We can't catch the ball. We're not throwing the ball to the right base anymore. That all changed with Mike Schilt. And last year, it just blossomed out in front of everybody. And you got to think, too, that Mike Schilt was so much from the George Kissel background, right, with, with mm-hmm. the book, with the Cardinal way, with the fact that he got one of those copies because all through the minor leagues, he so embodied those teaching principles. And then when I think back, if I'm Mike Schilt or if I'm – John Mosellock, knowing you had a great defense anyway, but then all the awards even solidifies that. I'm even more disappointed at what was going on early in the season, and we all know that injuries were a huge part of it. But besides the injuries, what was the Cardinals' biggest weakness, biggest bugaboo, especially the first third of the season? And some of it, yes, is because of personnel. We get that. Because of John Gant, because of Johan Oviedo wasn't ready, but what was the issue? It was walks. So think about that. If there's any team where you don't want to walk guys, if there's any pitching staff where you say, look, challenge these guys, even if you're not a strikeout pitcher, it's this team because guess what? You let them put the ball in play. You have five gold glovers behind you. You yeah. have the best defensive catcher of his generation. If Wayno's out there, you have a gold glove caliber pitcher out there. You you have a really strong shortstop position defensively. As I mentioned, Dylan Carlson had eight outfield assists. If there's any pitching staff that should not have been walking folks <laughs> this year, seriously, I, it was the I'm Cardinals. chuckling because it's the truth. You would watch in April and May and June, you're like, for crying out loud, guys, quit walking six, seven guys a night, let them hit the ball. And eventually, this group will catch the ball. They'll throw guys out. It, it it really was maddening to a point where you went, you know what? You almost wanted to go up and hey, uh, you're playing in a ballpark that suppresses home runs in Bush Stadium. Just let them hit it, and we'll take our chances. <laughs> I mean, you, you saw, it sounds silly, but there is some truth in that. When instead of having guys like Oviedo and Carlos and all those young guys that couldn't figure it out, hey, quit putting guys on base. You know, how many, what was it, 28 times they walked the bases loaded to get a run in? It was 28 or 29. I don't remember. I lost track. That's insane considering now you were pitching on a team that has five gold gloves on it. I mean, that's how insane that is. I mean, you just put that with those two sentences back to back. You go, well, what the heck were they thinking? I mean, it's not that hard to figure out. Let them hit the ball. Those guys will make plays for you. And I also think, so you have the great defense. And then you can also sign players or bring back players that fit that mold. And you saw that today. Now, I think everybody thought TJ McFarlane was coming back, but what was his thing? He was Mr. Double Play. And, Jim, as you said, during that 17-game winning streak, there were some amazing double plays, and TJ McFarlane was the guy that rolled some of those fantastic plays that we saw, especially down the stretch during that 17-game winning streak. So you bring that guy back. And and you can develop a pitching staff that also pitches to the fact that you have a great defense behind you. So TJ McFarland coming back. And then the other, uh, I don't know if it's a piece of news, because we already knew that Matt Carpenter, his option was not picked up. That uh, that happened last week. But he did have his goodbye or his thank you to Cardinal fans, to St. Louis, via the Players' Tribune. And uh, I think what's interesting when you talk about Matt Carpenter is, I know we... We remember what happened at the end, which was not great, let's be real, the last three years. And he signed that extension where (laughs) 
if anybody offers that extension, you're going to sign it. So that that yeah. part is certainly, hey, give his agent credit. But also, that's on the Cardinals' front office. So I understand that the last two, three years, we focused on that, and that's fair because that happened, and he wasn't he wasn't good, let's be real. But then I think that distorts the fact that this is one of the greatest Cardinals draft stories ever, full stop. When you have a dude who, as he mentioned in his goodbye, got, what, a bus ticket, a 1000 bucks, whatever it was, as a fifth-year senior at TCU, as a 13th-round draft pick, and he rolls that into 11 seasons with the Cardinals. And and who knows? Maybe he plays in the American League. you got to wonder, he's from Texas, lives in Texas, Texas Rangers. Could he be a guy who they want around to help with the younger players and maybe be a DH-type, bench-type player? I don't know. We'll see if he plays again. But when you look at Matt Carpenter's prime years, so he barely played in 2011 in the World Series year. He actually got one hit, so he barely played. And we all know the last three years were not great. They weren't good, and you don't discount that. But let's not forget that his absolute prime with the Cardinals, which was a seven-year stretch from 2012 to 2018, this man was really, really good. He was arguably their best hitter there. You had Matt Holiday, and some of those years you didn't make the playoffs. But you're talking about starting in 2012 where he was sixth in the Rookie of the Year voting. The next year, 2013, he's an all-star, a silver slugger. He finishes fourth in the MVP award. The next year, 2014, he's an all-star. 2015, he's 12th in the MVP. 2016, an all-star again. And then go up to 2018, and I know this was this was really a month and a half where he went crazy, but still, the man finished ninth in the National League MVP. He hit 36 home runs in the year 2018. I also think Matt Carpenter, the player, he's a hard type of player to quantify and evaluate because he has some of these newer stats and metrics that we focus more on, like walks on base percentage. He's not a big home run hitter, even though he did hit 36, as I mentioned, in 2018. But he's a big doubles guy, a big walks guy, a big on base percentage guy. And, and those are stats that are coveted, especially on base percentage and walks more so. This this guy, his career on base percentage, Jim, is 368. By the way, that's after three really bad years. His career OPS plus is 122. <laughs> that's after three really bad years. We're talking 22% above league average offensively for his career. In his best years, he was 140. He was 136. He was 143. We're talking about a player who is 35 to 40 percent above league average. In 2013, he led the league in runs with 126, in hits with 199, in doubles with 55. The next year, he led the league in walks with 95. The following year, 2015, he led the league in doubles. This guy led the league in categories three different years. So while we really focused on a lot of the negative the last three years, which which was fair. Mm-hmm. Let's not forget, this dude was a stud for seven years, and he was a stud basically out of nowhere as a 13th-round draft pick, a fifth-year senior out of college. I remember when he was down in the minors and he was having a pretty decent year, and Cardinals were trying to think, well, hey, we got a kid down in the minors, and everybody kept saying, he's playing third. I don't know if he's going to hit enough home runs to play third, but he hits. Got to find a place for him to play, and he came up. Uh, I, I did some numbers last week. I still get them written down here. I left out 2012, but I went 2013 to 2018, and for that time, he averaged 40 doubles. I mean, that's a doubles machine, 21 homers on the average. His batting average was 273, but that on base during that time was an average of 378, and he was a leadoff guy, remember, at that point, except for the one time they tried to make him a number three. They tried to move him in the lineup. It just didn't work. Mm-hmm. He was dead set on. Uh, and then, but hold on. It had nothing to do with batting leadoff. Remember, that was the narrative. I know he kept for saying that. For about five years, it, it, it had worked. nothing. It had nothing to do with leadoff except for the fact that every single time he batted leadoff, he was way better. Yes. Uh, and then the final stat I have from that period, his OPS plus was 131. And to your point, you know, you gave out those numbers, how great he was, 122 overall in his career. I mean, when he was early in his career, and he was doing his thing. He was a true asset to this baseball team, and 
uh, he had set the mark for most doubles in a season. That was held by Stan Musial. I mean, that's how impressive some of his years were. He should get more credit. I know it was painful to see him in the lineup down the stretch in the last three years, as you said, but the reality is when he was right, he was really good. You can't fault him for signing the contract that the front office gave him. Which we all would have signed. And the other half of that is he gave you $20 million seasons for about three years making about 500000 so for his first three years or so. And look, we started this whole segment talking about the Cardinals' amazing defense. And even though I don't think anybody would ever say that Matt Carpenter was a stellar defender, he no. was solid, but look at his numbers. He played 671 games at third. He played 333 games at first. That's two seasons. He played 246 games at second base. That's a season and a half. He played 25 games in the outfield. He also gave you very serviceable defensive flexibility with, let's be real, it was elite offense. It was elite offense for those seven seasons I mentioned. But one last thing I'll say, even in his final three years, which weren't good statistically, he took good at bat still. I mean, that's the one thing he would always do. He would always make that pitcher work. And you got to understand that that is a big factor when you're a leadoff guy. If you get a guy who can work a count for the rest of your lineup, and they see a guy get his pitch count up, you can see everything that the guy offers for that night and for the next night, that makes a that makes a difference. And so, um, yeah, it was time to move on. It's probably a couple of years too late, but he'll still be uh, he'll still be looked at. Look, when he comes back in ten years, we're not going to be booing Matt Carpenter. Let's no. put it that way. And he will be a Cardinals Hall of Famer. We can get into that debate maybe tomorrow. We're out of time. But you know he will be. And he's deserving. The Cardinals Hall of Fame, in my opinion, it was made for folks like Matt Carpenter. Guys who are homegrown, didn't obviously make Cooperstown, but were great Cardinal players for about a decade. For him, a seven-year stretch. That was really, really good. I know you may disagree, folks out there. Maybe we'll debate this tomorrow because we got to go.